this organization, or this activist for clean energy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Williams. <clears throat> I would like to actually um, just have a conversation with everyone in here. And I want to thank everyone who came today. Um, we would all have liked to see more people, more concerned landowners, more of our elected representatives, because we are actually at a, an interesting uh, part in our uh, society at this point, and it's honestly very exciting. It doesn't look like it right now for some folks, perhaps, but let me give you a little bit of uh, background and try to connect the dots, just so that you can appreciate what I'm trying to do here. Uh, this is called a smartphone. When I was a teenager, the amount of technology that is in the smartphone, in terms of the processor, in terms of all these electronic capabilities that the smartphone has, would have to fill a whole stage behind me. That is now in this little tiny thing. Just over my lifetime, technology, in terms of computer technology, processors, and everything else, has so dramatically changed that it's quite amazing to realize that we're still depending on a very old source of energy, that we're still using fossil fuels that we're still using, combustion engines, when we just in the lifetime have turned the whole stage into a little tiny pocket-sized machine. Let me give you another example. Because images really help to understand that we do have possibilities. I've talked about this before, and I have also had a piece in the Velocity Daily Times about this when it comes to what I'm calling entering the third solar age. We just look at the history of human flight. In 1783, early on in 1783, I'm sure there were millions of people who said we will never be able to fly. But then and later in that year, in 1783, the first hot air balloon went up in Paris, France, with three people on board. This is in 1783, it's the starting point. Then we come fairly quickly to the United States of America, where we have always had the talent and the will to carry things out in an amazingly fast fashion if we wanted to. In 1903, we have the first motorized flight happening in North Carolina. That is in 1903. In 1969, Apollo 11, I believe, lands on the moon. Neil Armstrong gets off that beautiful rocket and makes this one small step, a giant leap for mankind. That's in 1969. In 2013, last year, the first solar-powered airplane flew across the United States. Just think about it. Within my lifetime, the whole stage turns into a pocket-sized little machine. We've been really just a little bit more than 100 years from the beginning of flying in a motorized airplane to an airplane that actually is powered with solar energy. I've talked to Mr. Slaughter, Mr. Bennett, and many, many other people before, I know that we may be on different sides on a political spectrum. That's completely okay. I've never had an issue with that. I always see the human and the other person I'm confronting or discussing. The tragedy in this whole thing is, and this is when I'm looking at, at Larry over here, or when I look at Daniel and I look at uh, Mr. Slaughter and Mr. Bennett, the tragedy is we don't have to do any of it. We do not have to fight each other at all. None of this is necessary. We do not have to have yet another pipeline, even if that sounds convenient and practical, run right next to an already existing pipeline, because all of these pipelines are a sign of something that's called history, and it's outdated. I'm not saying that we can do this from one day to the next. I'm not going to be able to go to my house and say, okay, tomorrow it will be all solar. That's not going to happen. But if we can do this here in just my lifetime, if we can go from flying a motorized airplane in 1903 to 2013 with a solar-powered airplane, we know we're capable of so many more things. Let me talk about fossil fuels quickly. We have oil, we have natural gas, and we have coal. The worst is coal, followed by oil, and then comes natural gas. All of them are ultimately producing carbon dioxide emissions. Now, natural gas may be cleaner when it's burned, but it's a complete utter mess when it's harvested. If you ever have the chance to, you're going to need to mention this, there's, there's a documentary called Split Estate. Watch what's going on across the nation as a dying fossil fuel industry is trying to do, use the last couple of minutes it has in its existence to get the least, the last bit of oil and natural gas out so they can lengthen the time of the profits a little bit longer. But the thing is they're not paying attention. 
if Georgia Power is not paying attention, if Spectre Energy is not paying attention, it's not just going to be an empty seat here on our stage where we have an individual, Susan Wall, who has all sorts of nice, smart things to say, and she's in a safe environment, but doesn't dare to show up because she's afraid to confront reality, I think. The fact really is that fossil fuels are dying. Not just metaphorically speaking, but literally speaking. Uh, they are finer. Goldman Sachs, Walmart, Costco, Google, you can go on and on. There are companies all over the place who are heavily investing in renewable sources of energy. They're not doing this because they think it's fun. They're doing this because they realize in that this direction to go. It is estimated, and I've read two wonderful pieces on it just this morning to refresh this in my mind. One written by Paul Gilding, just on March 19, 2014. The title reads, Carbon Crash, Solar Dawn. If Georgia Power, for example, since we are in Georgia, does not pay attention, instead of fighting renewable sources of energy, they should be actually investing in re renewable sources of energy. There's a particular article that I read also where, uh, you, know, uh, you may know, may know it, an individual named Stephen Chu, has regularly meetings, uh, he worked for former administration, he knows a bit about physics and energy, had a number of conversations with utility companies to try to figure out what to do to make that step, because honestly we are like people who are addicted to tobacco. I have a highway right here, this is like an existing pipeline, you could say. I can put another kind of pipeline in there to smoke a little bit more nicotine, but that's not going to help me with an addiction, we need to get away from it. But let me get to the point. What he says is when you are confronting utility companies, he has usually three reactions. And these reactions are not just utility companies, they're also with, who I think are dearly concerned people also in this room. Either they are open enough to different possibilities and alternatives, or just to listening and asking, tell us what to do. Tell us how this might work. And that's the positive attitude. That's like, let's check this out. Or they're reacting like a deer in a headlock. They don't know what to do. They're standing still. They're not moving. And if you're not moving, you may get hit. Or we have, which is the unfortunate case, the situation where they're saying, we're going to fight this. What Georgia Power should be doing, what Spectra Energy should be doing, is to get on board with it what is unstoppable. If you look at the development of the stock portfolios of these companies, if you look at Goldman Sachs, and again, Costco, and Walmart, and Google, and, and Ikea, and Warren Buffett, and so on and so on, they should actually invest in solar, just like old phone companies owned the phone lines and the phone, you pay them, help homeowners put solar panels on their roof, you wouldn't have to pay it down, but you would then pay money to the utility company every single month, which would then give them the regular type of profits or income they need to survive, because if they're not, there will be a crash, and companies like Georgia Power will have a hard time recovering from this. At this point, they're fighting it. They should be on board with this. At this point, you, Mr. Slaughter, and Larry, and I, you may be fighting each other, but none of this is really necessary. We should be really going a completely different direction. It can be done. And I'm not saying this can be done from one day to the next. I'm not naive. But I do know it can be done. I've seen it. I'm coming from Germany, so I talk a little funny. We have invested in renewable sources of energy in Germany, as they have in, in Spain, and it's, it has taken off big time in the United States of America. I guarantee you, in the year 2030 or 40, at the very latest, if we should go ahead, go ahead with this nonsense of building this pipeline, and all this wonderful infrastructure, which for a short amount of time will create all these wonderful profits, that infrastructure is going to run dead. It's going to be dead. There will be no use to it. The other thing, the last thing I should mention, fossil fuels are not just there to be burned for energy. That's the least efficient use of fossil fuels anyway. If you know anything in terms of the need for fossil fuels for such things as pharmaceutical products, plastics, propelling your army, protecting your country, we're wasting it by burning it. We're increasing the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere, and have all sorts of different results they have in terms of global climate change. Now, I wish it would be 100 degrees outside, you would believe me about global climate change. It's very difficult for people to believe it because there are these topsy-turvy events, but when you have a Winter Olympics in Sochi, 
or it's warmer in at the winter living than it is in Florida, you know something is wrong. There are drought records in California. California is the place where all our vegetables and fruits are coming from. We have a crisis on our shoulder in the coming summer, the coming year in terms of supply of vegetables and fruits. Honestly, this is really not that big of a deal. It can easily be done. We shouldn't be fighting each other. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Slaughter, Mr. Bennett, Tom, all of you guys, we should be sitting together and work this out and going in a completely different direction. Instead, we're trying to appease the authorities, which are completely arrogant in their behavior, abusive of their powers, completely lack of vision, and we have, we have more than one alternative available. That's the only issue I have. I have no personal issue with Mr. Slaughter or Mr. Bennett, or anybody else, because I know it's hard to see sometimes that there is a change on the horizon, but it is so easily visible. It really is. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much.